Perfect. All right, so let's talk about sudden cardiac death first. Here's a map of the United States where you can see that the heart disease death is the number one cause, as you probably guys know. It's actually one out of three death that occurs annually in the United States are from heart disease. And you can see that it's not homogeneous also. Now, sudden cardiac death is the death that occurs within an hour, okay? And I want you to put special attention because some people use this interchangeably sudden cardiac arrest and sudden cardiac death. Sudden cardiac arrest is when it's treatable with a therapy, so in cardiac is not. So an estimate is about 300 to 400,000 dead a year, so in cardiac death, okay? And if we say, if we think about every death that occurs of a cardiovascular, half of them will be so in cardiac death, meaning within an hour, okay? Now, putting that in mind perspective, that's a lot of dead, and we're thinking, well, where is it coming from? And it's actually, they call it the inverse pyramid. So as you can see on the left side, okay, you have the overall population. The overall population is actually the healthiest one. It has the minimal risk for having sudden cardiac death, but in the opposite, it has, it has the most numbers. Why is that? Well, because the size of the population is humongous. The people at low risk is huge. So, but even if you go start going down, this is the group with hypertension, diabetes, okay, you can see that they are a higher group, and they still have a significant amount of sudden cardiac death. Now we go to the people with CAD, their risk is even higher, and the group smaller, and so on, on and on. You can see 30% of EF, which is people who most of the time have a defibrillator, has almost like a 20% chance of having an event. But however, overall, the problem is a small percent. Then you have the hospital cardiac arrest survivals, which are the secondary prevention. It's almost mandatory that they have a defibrillator before going to the, ho to the house. And you can see the, the, the incidence between 30 to 30 percent. However, overall, the problem or well, the amount of event for this patient population is pretty small. So as you can see, it's, it's a really hard condition to treat. And, um, and we have to find a way to better do this. Okay? And the first pioneer in this center was um, actually Michael Mirowski. He worked in Israel and then the hospital. And he was actually hired by Dr. Harry Heller. And Dr. Harry Heller was the chief of cardiology at that hospital. And unfortunately, Dr. Harry Heller died from ventricular tachycardia. He was suffering from recurrent episodes of ventricular tachycardia. And uh, he, one time he was di having dinner at home and suddenly collapsing from the whole family. And it was a disaster. And um, Michael really was impressed with that situation. And he put in his head that if he hadn't had a defibrillator at that time, his friend would still be alive. And that his journey began in 1966 when he would think, well, let's put an implantable cardiac defibrillator. Everybody thought this guy is crazy. He's going to put a bump, an electronic bump in somebody walking around, and anytime you go around, you're going to get shocked, right? Sound like, who wants that? Who wants a bump inside your body? But he pushed, and look, it took 22 years to do the first implant in human. Now, these days, these defibrillators is one of the major things that save life around. So it has evolved. And how do they work, actually? And this you can see in a, this is an intracardiac electrogram, OK? As you can see, the trip later, the, the first thing they do is sense, right? So it takes the intracardiac signals and then classify and process the data. When he starts processing the data here in the last channel, you can see that he measures the, the cycle in between each signal. And if they're in a consecutive, in a, in a, in a category, he can put it into a ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, or non-ventricular tachycardia. In this case, you can see that it's pretty fast. So it's, at this point, he assumes, OK, we're in the presence of a ventricular fibrillation. At this moment, the capacitator is starting to subtract energy from the battery. Once that is fully charged, it delivers. However, before delivering, he will still confirm it that he's in that rhythm. Otherwise, you don't want to go spontaneously broke the ventricular tachycardia, the ventricular fibrillation, and shock the patient. So just immediately before delivering the shock has to confirm. The other thing is that, as you guys can see, we talk about the pacemaker, the three layers, is in the VVI mode. So the, pa the defibrillator now is going to be switched to a VVI mode and see if there's any necessary to give a beat. You will give him a beat. OK? Sometimes after shock, the cardiac myocardial is stone, the automaticity of the cell is impaired. So it takes time to recover. And that's where the pacemakers, that's why all the fibrillators are pacemakers. All right. So that's how it works. Now, 
what are the type of defibrillator. So this is very important. The first thing you have to put in your mind is this is an automatic and manual, okay? I don't want you to like, you have a defibrillator, you put the patch on, and then you stand like this, watching the patient. No, this is gonna fire. No, no, no. It's a manual de defibrillator. There are some manual defibrillators, so you have to be careful which one are automatic and which are, are manual. And the funny part is that nobody says it. You know, you can grab a box in the middle of the hallway and you have to really figure out right there with all the adrenaline that is going on if it's automatic or manual. The key, if it has one button, has to be automatic, right? You put the patch on, turn it on, that ceiling will start talking to you. Also, it has to have a speaker. If it's automatic and it's external, like in this one, it has to have a speaker to talk to you to separate from the patient, okay? Okay, putting that aside, so we have these four type of automatic defibrillator. This is external, then Dr. J.B. Duran talked about the light vest that you have right here, okay? It's a pretty good option. Then you have the most common one that will have the most data, okay, which is the transvenous. This goes, this is like a pacemaker with a lead and goes attached to the heart, okay? And then here we have the subcutaneous, which is also has been recently. So let's go really quick about each one and you can give you the pros and cons. I think it's very important. First of all, this is a manual defibrillator. You can see it has more than one button. So be familiarized with it. Don't start looking around, panicking. Okay, where do I turn on? So usually the number one is the one for turning on, okay? So you go over there, turn it on, then usually you select the energy and then you press charge and then you have to say, everybody clear and charge. Pretty straightforward there. Here you have your pacing capabilities, okay? Here, pacers on, you can increase the rate, increase the output, okay? And here you usually the monitor settings, okay? So be familiar, Take it doesn't take too much, but go to the hospital, especially when you start working in a new hospital, new environment, be familiar with the type of the external defibrillator they have. Okay, perfect. So let's go with the traditional one, the transvenous. Here you can see you have the pulse generator, okay, you have the lead, okay, and you have an atrial pace lead here, and an LV pace lead, and a defibrillator lead. How do I know it's a defibrillator lead? You guys see the difference? There's a coil here. So only by x-ray, you can only know, already know, if the patient cannot even talk, you can know if it's a defibrillator or a pacemaker. If you see a coil, that has to be a defibrillator, okay? Here is an oral coil in the SVC. Usually we can put one or two coils depending on the defibrillation threshold, okay? All right, here's the x-ray of a subcutaneous. You can see the difference. The can is on the left side and on the bottom, right? In the other one, it was up high here. Why we do that? Well, because we, in this case, the vector is different. We want to put the vector of the electricity from this direction to this direction, okay? And the, and the coil is actually under the skin. You guys can see it here? That's where we put it, under the, under the skin above the sternum, okay? So here's your can in lateral view, here's the coil, okay? And this is how it sends, okay? It has this, uh, three different vectors that you can use this in subcutaneous. The problem with this one is the pacemaker capabilities after shock. You can only have 30 seconds of transcutaneous pacing. After that, you're on your own. And that's, I think, one of the things that we need to be working on in the future. Also, they have a new system just came up this year. It was much smaller can. Perfect. So we're cruising around. We're perfect. You guys know about shocking. And, but there's a feature that you have to be aware that it's called anti-tachycardia pacing. There are two modalities to treat on the defibrillators, okay? For the first, the shock that we already reviewed about it. And this is the anti-tachycardia pacing. So what is anti-tachycardia pacing? As you can see, we're in the setting here of a mono monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. Pretty straightforward. And then here, you start to pace faster than the ventricular tachycardia. What's the idea is to fully capture. You can see here that you're going way faster than what it was before. And then after you terminate the pacing, it broke. So how is that possible? We're gonna go over it. But on the bottom, you guys can see how the device think it. Look, start processing the signal, say, oh, this is ventricular tachycardia. Let's avoid a shock and try to do anti-tachycardia pacing, right? It's less decremental for the patient. So you start do a run, which is fully programmable. You can say how fast do the, the anti-tachycardia pacing want to go, and also you can say if you wanted a burst or ramp. These are two modalities how to do the ATP. And then after that, you can see that the tachycardia terminated. This is a ventricular sense, and this, I think, is a ventricular pace. Okay, and 
It, the bottom line is that it works. Sometimes, sometimes it's proarrhythmogenic. Sometimes with ATP, the patient can go to PFIP and then you'll have to shock. Also, some devices have the opportunity to do ATP while charging, okay? So you start charging, and if the ATP terminated, then we abort the shock. How does it work? So imagine that when, you, when we're talking about monomorphic ventricular tachycardia, 85% of the cases are re-entering, okay? When we talk about re-entering, there's a circuit established and there's a path. And that path follows an action potential, okay, which is the arrow, and the wave level on that action potential, which is this is the beginning, and this is the end. From the beginning to the end, there's a gap. And you guys can see here, that's what we call the excitable gap. So any electricity that comes around here can enter the circuit. Now, if I try to enter here, I probably won't because the action potential is already passed and I'm refractory. So in, in option B, I did a stimulus just before, okay, the action potential reached to the excitable gap. I enter the circuit and start looping around and I what we call a reset. Okay, so it goes faster around that circle. However, the other, the other portion collide with the beginning of the action potential, okay? But we don't see that. We only see, like in the prior slide, that the QRS start earlier than what it was. Why? Because we were able to enter the excitable gap and we were able to reset. However, we terminated the tachycardia. So how is that possible? Well, when you provoke the stimulus, right in the time when you collide both ends, the tail, and the beginning, so you, after pacing, will terminate the tachycardia because the re-entering is completely a stop. So it's all about the right timing. We just gamble to do it in the right time when we do this first ADP pacing. And now I know it's time to lunch, so you guys are getting hungry. And this is like a donut, so I can't let you leave without knowing about magnet, okay? Because they're gonna call you in the middle of the night, hey, can you put a magnet? What will we do and everything? Interesting. Here you have the company's recommendation. As you can see, St. Jude recommend to put the packet or on top or the bottom. Medtronic actually covering the whole device and then soaring, which is very rare, okay, will probably put it on the side. Why is this? Well, it's a circuit that you establish. There are different mechanisms, different company make that circuit. The most common is the real, right? When you do a magnet, there's a, a flat and a flat metal steel here they come together with the magnet, and that circuit will overdrive the other circuit and will be a different programmable. In bottom line, nutshell, what does a magnet do to a pacemaker? Make it an asynchronous pacing, okay? What does a magnet make it a defibrillator? It suppresses the tachycardia therapy. It doesn't affect the pacing. There are caveats, but that's the general rule, okay? And I think that's the end. The last slide that I have, it's a new innovation. I hope it's coming soon. The idea is to have a drone defibrillator. <laughs> this drone actually can fly 100 miles per hour. You call 911, they will activate it. It will fly over, track you to your GPS on your phone, your step away, it will land on you, and then it will start talking to you. Believe me, this is automatic. You don't have to worry. Take the patches, put on the patient, and shock the patient. And the idea is like in two minutes, the whole city can cover with a defibrillator. Thank you very much.